are. Okay, we are live. Hello, I warmly welcome you to our 48th webinar by the Academy of Space Renaissance International. My name is Sabine Heinz, and I'm the person responsible for our webinars uh, or webinar series and one of the vice presidents of uh, SRI. And on this 9th of October, I am really delighted that you have come to join us and we have people watching from Ireland, from Dublin, uh, from Norway, from Planet Reunion and from Austria. Hello, Werner. <laughs> Um, um, our today's special guest is uh, Rick Tumlinson. Um, hello, Rick. Hello, you said that very well. I yes, we are glad to have you here. Uh, I also would like to welcome Adriano Ottino. Uh, he is also vice president of SRI and uh, our former president and one of the founders of SRI. And uh, he joined the recently um, 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 the, um, conference in Baku, uh, yes. IAF, uh, uh, IAC conf uh, meeting in, in Baku, and uh, together with our president, Bernard Foyne. Hello, Adriano. Hi, hi, Sabine. Hi, Rick. Uh, very happy to have you here. Uh, you, you, uh, with Rick, we are friends. See, I think since 2008, maybe from the very beginning of SRI, and uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, to meet and to listen to, uh, yeah, the the the, the vision of uh, Rick Tomlinson is one of the let me say uh, one of the founders of the new space uh, age. So therefore, we are very happy to have you here and to listen to. Uh, your vision and uh, to your also your impression of the actual time and uh, uh, where we are going, why we are going, and what we are doing, and all these kind of things. So I'm I'm, I'm sure this will be a very, very interesting uh, lecture uh, by you. So very welcome, and uh, let's go ahead. I'm sure of this, and also uh, the Africa VR campus and uh, center tuned in uh, from Makubuki land in Africa. Rick, before I give you the floor, I would like to introduce you to our audience. Rick is a co-founder of several space companies and nonprofits, including Deep Space Industries, Orbital Outfitters, the New World Institute, and the Space Frontier Foundation. He is an active space entrepreneur and space activist. He has testified uh, on space-related topics before the US Congress six times since 1995. In 2004, Space News magazine listed Tamlingson as one of the 100 most influential people in the space industry. So we are really glad to have you here, that you take your time to talk to us and uh, called one of the world's uh, top space visionaries and uh, most influential people in the space field, Rick Tumlinson had coined the term new space and is credited uh, with help birth the new commercial space under industry highlighted by Musk, Bezos, Branson, and others. A leading writer, speaker, and six-time congressional witness, Rick helped start the first mission to find water on the moon, signed the first space commercial data purchase agreement, let the commercial take over of the Russian Mir space station, signed the first private astronaut to fly to the space station, co-founded the Space Frontier Foundation, and was a founding board member of the X Prize. In, nine, uh, in 2015, he won the World Technology Award uh, along with Great Venture uh, of the Human Genome Project. He founded the Space Fund Venture Capital Company with 20 space companies in its portfolio and is a member of the US, US Space Force Doctrine Organization Group. Rick Space Revolution Radio Port is on iHeart Radio Networks, iRock Space Radio, and most podcast, podcast sites. 
He hosts the New World Conference and Space Cowboy Ball in Austin. And his nonprofit Earthlight Foundation is working to save the Earth while expanding life into the cosmos. The recently initiated permission to dream to raise funds for placing a telescope in every middle school on Earth that wants one so that new generations can see the rings of Saturn and the mountains of the moon. Rick, the stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you. It's a very kind introduction. Um, so we're going to do the usual thing, which is muck about with trying to get Zoom to work and um, and to do the PowerPoint. So let's try that first. Um, I have a, a personal theory that um, once human beings are able to master uh, Zoom and PowerPoint, uh, the universe will be ours. So let's see if we can make this happen. Um, yes. the, uh, it's gonna take me just a moment to... You can add now Google Calendar to this tricky thing. Yes. yes, once we have these things figured out, look yeah. out universe, here we come. Um, so I guess the first thing I do is I'm gonna put this in presentation mode. Um, and uh, I'm gonna take it back. You should share your screen. Yes, I will. I'm gonna... Um, but for he has to open the presentation if it's true. Hmm? Yeah, well, it, it jumped right into the middle. So I'm going to do that. And now we are going to... Denise. <laughs> this is why he is AV watching from audiovisual people are the, the most important people in the space community. Um, okay, let's see if we can make that work. Now, if it's the right screen, it should be... Screen just two and let's see here. You should see perfect. You see that the space. Yes. Yes. Now you can start your presentation and okay. All right. Hold it. No, no, no. It's showing the wrong one. Um. Of course it is. Is it showing the full screen or are you seeing the images uh, down the side? Uh, we still see uh, the presentation. You have to put it on full screen uh, by starting the presentation. Now we see it on full screen. And, and we switch we off our... Go for liftoff. Perfect. All right. So anyway, I am uh, I really thank you all for inviting me. Um, uh, Adriano and, and uh you guys have been doing a lot of great work late, lately, uh, especially with the uh, SDG types of activities. I'm proud to be a supporter of that. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of a time. I've thrown a couple of things together. Um, you've made the mistake of giving me too much time. And so we're going to uh, use that all up. Um, anyway, I call it the space revolution. And we'll, we'll get back into that in a moment. Um, you have already um, mentioned my... Radio Pod. Um, I will say I interviewed, uh, had a conversation with Peter Beck of Radio Lab last week. That should be coming out in the next week or two. It's on IROC, I R O C, Space Radio. But it's also available. I think there are 22 episodes available on Apple Airplay. Um, you mentioned my company, spacefund.com. Um, I will do a commercial there and say we are looking for. Um, uh, major investors. Uh, we're getting ready to, right now we have about $20 million invested in 21 startups. Um, well, not exactly startups. I, I think we invested a tiny bit in some little company called SpaceX, but otherwise they're mainly startups. And um, we're getting ready to raise, uh, we are actually in the beginning phases of raising a 50 to $100 million fund and are eager to talk to anybody in a sophisticated uh, investor level who might be interested in, in uh, joining us on this next round. I can say that um, so far, knock on wood, as they say, superstitiously, uh, all of our companies are still alive, which is actually very unusual. Um, and the uh, the fund is uh, moving into uh, some very serious profitability. Um, 
New Worlds is our event. Uh, this is uh, November 17th and 18th here in Austin, Texas. Um, there's the link newworlds.space. Uh, we blend all kinds of activities in that event, um, including, uh, I heard you mention art. Um, I don't have the newest poster here, um, but uh, we're very, very much into art and uh, music. And um, it's the kind of event where you're gonna see a lot of different things happening. Um, and uh, we are actually gonna have poetry uh, this year. Um, you know you're in a very unusual event when you walk in and there's somebody sitting on stage playing an electric sitar. I, um, that's probably just uh, says enough right there. And then we have the Space Cowboy Ball. Uh, it is a costume fundraising party that asks the question, what would you wear uh, on a, at a party on Mars in 100 years? And we get some very fun answers to that question, as you can see. Um, it is Austin. Those of you who may not know much about Austin, Texas, our slogan is keep Austin weird. And uh, we really work very hard to make sure that occurs. We have some very interesting guests like this gentleman who has a little bookstore called Amazon. Um, and he is receiving there the Space Cowboy Award, um, which we give out every year. I can't tell you who's winning this year, but uh, they're gonna be very interesting people. Uh, last year, the lady in the cowboy hat at the top won. Her name is Gwen Shotwell and she runs a little company called SpaceX. Uh, again, people have a lot of fun here. Those of you who are Yuri Knight, Yuri's Knight, you may, uh, or, or space kind people, you may recognize Loretta Hidalgo in the image there. And the lady with the red, <laughs> the funny red hair um, is named Lori Garver. And she used to work for NASA uh, back a long time ago and has a, a great book out uh, that you should read. Uh, and again, New Worlds, uh, I'm going to give you a second there if you want to aim at the screen and grab that or just go to newworlds.space. Whoops, that jumped a little quick. Um, it is, we're very, it's a very unusual event, uh, only about 300 people. It's been called the best little space conference on earth. Uh, the ball itself is actually designed to raise money for dream scopes. The idea there is there are people raising money to put individual people into space, such as my friends at Space for Humanity and Dylan Taylor and his group. Um, and there are a lot of great groups out there. My friend Frank White, uh, who's going to receive an award at our event, um, is, uh, you know, created the overview effect. Um, but we're about, uh, you know, and I'll get into our philosophy towards the end here, but one of our philosophies involves the uh, experiencing and exploring everything in the universe. And we, we believe that um, it's quite a pivot point when somebody's very young or no matter what age, but that the first time you look through a telescope, something shifts, something changes. Um, when you can see the rings of Saturn and the moons of Mars. Uh, so we're delivering, uh, developing dream scopes. Probably in a few months, uh, schools around the world will be able to apply. It's too early yet, we're just getting started. In fact, next week we're placing our first four scopes in a, um, a uh, school district here in the southern part of Texas. Um, it's an experiment to make sure we get it all right. Um, you can actually see one of the scopes behind me. Um, and um, that'll be ramping up in the years to come. Uh, we're hoping to set up perhaps a, a telescope dating service. And what we mean by that is schools will be applying middle schools and they will be asking for scopes. And then we will find people who sponsor them. Um, Currently, the price to sponsor a scope is around 2,000 US dollars, but these are very nice automated scopes. And we also give a small check to each school to help fund the activities around the scope. And what's interesting is people who sponsor them, we call them dream dealers. Uh, and we are sort of playing into the drug dealer idea, except this is the most positive drug you can have, which is hope and vision and the idea of exploration. Um, and, uh, it's we think it's going to be a fun project it's just ramping up right now so back to the uh the presentation the space revolution so when i was growing up uh something really interesting happened and that was this little silver ball called sputnik was uh flown into space what's really um very intriguing to me is that within the span of my life having seen this beginning i myself myself might have the chance to actually go now, there were several other people born roughly in the same period of time. You've heard of them, um, you know, the billionaire, the billionaire club. Um, 
they get a, a lot of fun poked about them. Um, but I, it's really important to understand that while they are investing their own money in, in making this happen, because they do share the dream, um, it's really not about them. It's about her, the mother world. I love the earth. I am uh, a very hardcore, I was in Greenpeace one summer in college. Um, I'm very, very hardcore believer and, and um, passionate about this amazing uh, world we live in with all its uh, wonders and beauties. I also love these crazy former apes that used to live, that live here now and um, have slowly evolved um, into what we are today. And it really is about us as well. Look, people are good in my mind. They're, they are um, overall good. Yes, we see terrible things happening uh, over this last weekend and the last year. And so we see things happening all the time, but that is the aberration. Um, you know, the reason that these things are called news is because they are not what people usually do. Most people are good. And I love this picture because I see the, the eyes of that child. And, and when I see those eyes, it makes me um, truly believe that there is always hope, no matter in the darkest situations. Now, we did, um, after Sputnik, kind of move into a phase where we began to um, go into space and open it up. Um, but we've never really broken out. We're still trapped in a cage. And the cage isn't about radiation or vacuum or gravity. It's about our lack of imagination, our inability to give ourselves permission to dream. Now, I watched all of this happen, uh, the Apollo program uh, back in the day, and this is um, a pretty good representation of the kind of home I would have grown up in and people in my generation. And, you know, it was during that time that it was rough then back, back then as well. I mean, we always think, every generation thinks their, their world is the most chaotic. Ours was chaotic too. I remember watching television and Flipping through the channels, uh, it was President Kennedy talking, and there were race riots in America. And yet at the same time, you'd flip the channel, it'd be these great people going to the moon. And then you'd have these terrible politicians doing uh, awful things, so lying and cheating and stealing. And then at the same time, though, we would see pictures of the Earth broadcast from space. Um, in fact, you know, it was an image of space that gave us our first real understanding of the, the fragility of this amazing little bubble we call home. The fact that we are in a spaceship, and I'll mention that again later. And then terrible things, the Vietnam War and others. And then we would flip the channel and, oh my God, we're going out into the solar system, the universe and beyond with Galileo and Voyager. And yet the same technologies are the ones that could destroy us by launching nuclear weapons to the other side of the world. And then I'd flip the channel as a kid and oh my gosh, we're driving on the moon. It was so amazing, all of it. it, it it's this contrast, you know? And, and even then, here I am looking at the world um, in, in a way and we're seeing people driving on the moon and so exciting. And yet we teetered on the edge of nuclear war. And, and then I'd flip the channel again and there was Star Trek and Captain Kirk and his crew heading out to go where no one has gone before. As a child watching all of this, I got to, it rolled into my mind and, and it became a blur. It's like, well, okay, if we're going to the moon and we're driving around on the moon and we're sending these probes out in the solar system and there's Star Trek, I wanna make that happen in my life. And, you know, I went to the movies and saw one of the greatest movies ever, um, ever shown. And that was the 2001 Space Odyssey. Um, I, I highly recommend it. And if you're young and you've never seen it, go see it. Read the book first. Um, I rarely recommend that. I usually say, watch a movie um, or don't read the book first. Watch the movie, then read the book. It fills in everything. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that happens in this movie where it's just beautiful music playing and the book will help you understand it. But when you watch it, it may seem to move a bit slow and everything, but you have to understand that at that point when this was shown, nobody had ever done anything like it. And uh, a good friend of mine, Arthur C. Clarke, had written this book, and it was made into a movie. Um, and then, of course, Star Wars. You know, it, it, it's amazing that we can, we have this craving to move out of ourselves all of the time and go into better places. And, you know, for me, it was like, oh, my gosh, you know, I want to do this. I want to be Han Solo. I want to go. I want to go. And yet, at the same time, 
as we're, this was all happening, they're going to the moon and our dreams are growing and they walked on the moon. And by the time they were done, all they had left behind was flags and footprints. And so there we were, this entire generation. Now, there's a book they, uh, by Malcolm Gladwell called The Outliers. And he talks a bit about the generation, roughly, that I came up in. People like, uh, you know, the uh, founder of Apple and uh, the founder of Microsoft. Um, you know, Jeff Bezos, a uh, little later, Elon Musk, and all of us grew up on these dreams. I was not a billionaire, nor am I now. Um, this is me. My dad had three jobs. Um, he worked for the military, worked at the gas station. And I, uh, on Saturday mornings, he would wake us up and we would go clean the base bowling alley. I still remember the smell of beer and cigarettes from the, the ashtrays at the bowling alley as a kid. Um, so I was a very, very working class family. But, you know, no matter where you are, who, who you are, what your origins are, where your feet are on the ground, whether they're in mud or in fancy shoes or slippers or wherever you are, wherever you stand, you can still reach for the stars and you can still have a dream. And so during that period of Apollo and later, um, it was it, we thought that we could go anywhere and we could do anything. In fact, it was during that period that we were being promised a thing called the space shuttle. The space shuttle gave us the idea that, hey, we can go anywhere. We were told at the time in the 1970s there was going to be $100 a pound to go to space. And there were going to be 50, five zero flights a year. It seemed very real during that period of time. In fact, at the time, there were two space stations in orbit, um, Skylab and Salyut. And it just seemed like, hey, man, this is going to happen. It was during that time that this gentleman, Gerard K. O'Neill, wrote this amazing book, The High Frontier. Dr. O'Neill, to me, is the father of the space revolution. Now, Werner von Braun, you know, he built the rockets, when we watched the rockets go into space and all of this. And, you know, that's the government space program. And Carl Sagan had this kind of voice and he sounded really good. And he talked about the great vision, but he, he didn't really want us to go out there. He just wanted us to look, but don't touch. But Dr. O'Neill, he came along and he said, you can go. Anybody can go. And that was critical. It was a total shift. Back then, you have to understand, there weren't all these space conferences and everything everywhere. The only conferences around were those that the um, astronauts and scientists and government employees would go to, nobody else. And the thing is, it's interesting. If you look at the cover there, I actually worked on this reprint and um, helped uh, supervise it. Um, Dr. O'Neill was very insistent. He wanted to show a family in space regular people sitting on a beach in a, in a habitat, a sphere in this case. That's what he wanted to see happen, that you and I could go, use your minds, your imaginations, the resources of space and create a new place for humanity to live. And it wasn't just a book, it got a lot of us excited. Um, what's really interesting is that little black and white picture you're seeing in the corner, there's a guy with a mustache over on, I guess it's your left or right, um, his name was Eric Drexler. Eric actually came up with the term nano from nanotech because he, he liked the idea of using these little nanotech devices that could be released maybe on an asteroid and chew it up. Uh, it was also about the idea of doing things very small because it's very expensive to go to space. Um, and then on the right, there's the mass driver. The mass driver was a device that the members of the organization that Dr. O'Neill had founded at the time um, we uh, funded it and put it together. That little piece of wire and plywood helped us prove the 1800 gravities of acceleration one would need to escape lunar gravity. I like to say I helped, but basically I stood in the corner and handed really smart people wrenches and tools. And yes, that is Freeman Dyson standing next to me at the end there. He was Dr. O'Neill's partner in crime, shall we say. Dr. O'Neill created a community of dreamers that this is only some of the organizations that came out of his work all around the world. Um, and I, I was the co-founder and the founder of the uh, Space Frontier Foundation as one of them. I had started with the L5 Society in New York, and I helped the fundraising on the International Space University a few years later. 
The problem is that when this thing started to fly, we began to realize it was a lie. In fact, it only threw, flew about three and a half times a year. Um, cost per seat, roughly 170 million. The actual cost per pound, $10,000. So it really wasn't what we had uh, been told it was going to be. So um, the people in the Space Frontier in particular, Space Frontier Foundation, we, we got a little radical and we started working on the Hill on a whole bunch of different projects. Our first one was to turn in a, a petition with 40,000 signatures calling on America to return to the moon. We had somebody in the inside of the White House who actually then told then President Bush, the first one, about the petition. I actually ran into him just this weekend at the Mars Society. And we were going over that tale and story of because he was actually the person who was liaison um, for the um, one of the uh, presidential um, uh, assistants. And he's the one who helped carry the word in that this group, Space Frontier Foundation, had 40,000 signatures. Now, when I say 40,000 signatures, you have to understand this was the old days. We stood there with clipboards and pens at metros and got people to sign. And we uh, photographed uh, or uh, photocopied all of them. And it was based on that that the first President Bush said we were going to go back to the moon. The problem is that everybody in NASA decided that all of their projects had to have something to do with the moon. And it became what was called the kitchen sink moon budget. And it was too much and it died. So during that period of time, we were looking around for what was happening. And we believed very firmly that it really was about us and not about the governments. And so we came up with this idea called new space. And new space, I didn't actually coin the term. I had been saying for many years that we needed a a, a new space industry, that we were entering a new space um, agenda was going, and all of these different things. It was actually some friends of mine uh, who were in the Space Frontier Foundation that put the two words together into one. Uh, so I have to give them credit. Um, they, they, they were the ones who came up with jamming the words together. But the definition is, was very clear. Any company or project that has the goal of, is funded by, or if successful, will help open the high frontier of space to life and humanity. That was what new space was about. We actually got involved, and don't try and read this, it's, I hate slides with too much text on, I just wanna show you, we did a bunch of things and we worked, for example, at one point we tried to cancel the International Space Station. You're gonna jump back and go, what? Why would they do that? Because we didn't believe that when President Reagan a, a few years before had said it was gonna be $8 billion and it was gonna be finished by 1993. Turned out we were right. It was never finished. It's still not finished. And they have spent over a hundred billion dollars on it. We did not believe that governments should build buildings and drive trucks. That's the private sector's job. Government can help fund exploration and help seed things with its expenditures, which I'll get back to in a minute. Um, we then ended up trading that off to support a vehicle. Uh, we, oh, we almost killed it by one vote. We got within one vote of killing it. Or as my friends from NASA and I joke about now, they saved it by one vote. Um, then we, were, um, we traded that off to help support a vehicle called the DCX. If you haven't seen video of the DCX, um, we're in the 50th, uh, 30th anniversary year. We just had um, a meeting about it um, in California with some of the people that worked on it. The DCX was the first single stage demonstrator it led the way for what you see coming out of Blue Origin and SpaceX. Um, and go watch the videos on YouTube when you get a chance. This thing was amazing. It didn't go all the way to space, but it demonstrated the idea of taking up, taking off and landing vertically. And it would do all of these interesting um, moving around type things and then um, would land. Pete Conrad, the astronaut, drove it for a while. And then we worked very, very hard to um, to end the shuttle program. And I was part of a team um, that took over the mirror. The main thing was our main job, our main accomplishment was that we changed the conversation from space being about governments to space being about people and their companies and the private sector. And that was our biggest, I, I think, accomplishment of the Space Frontier Foundation. 
At the time, and still, there are many space organizations that will never, ever say that NASA or the space agencies are doing anything wrong. Um, we were the bad boys and girls who actually said, no, you've got to change what you're doing. And so during the 90s, we also helped write laws and policies that later enabled SpaceX and other companies to carry uh, astronauts um, to the space station. We helped set up tax incentives and other things. Uh, my friends in Washington working with me. And then some of us uh, got involved in other activities. But the change in the conversation that was core to what we were doing was that space is a place, not a program. And that's a critical thing to keep in mind. It's not your government program. It's just another place. During this time, we saw things like the Conestoga One, the first private rocket, which launched off the coast of Texas. It failed, but it was the very first time uh, anybody had ever tried to fly a commercial rocket. I was very lucky to be a part of the team. Uh, we went over to Russia after the end of the Soviet Union, negotiated a deal, and set up a company called Mircorp. Um, you can see a video about that. Um, it's called Orphans of Apollo. Now, while we were there, the State Department wasn't letting us fly the tether technology that we wanted to fly, which would have allowed us to keep it in space for a long time very cheaply. So we had to figure out how to make some money. And at a meeting um, of my uh, friend John Spencer's group in uh, California, I met a, a gentleman named Dennis Tito. He's the little bald guy there. Um, shook his hands and uh, offered him a ride. Um, and so he paid for us to fly him to the mirror. Uh, unfortunately, the powers that be, NASA and the others that were working on the big space station, ended up bulldozing us and we lost the mirror. So we transferred Dennis Tito over to the International Space Station. He became the first private astronaut um, who bought a ticket to space. So uh, very lucky to have participated in that, but it, it came about because of other people's activities and, and things like that. Eventually, we killed the shuttle. And yes, we killed the space shuttle. An amazing, exciting vehicle. I know many people who worked on the shuttle, flew the shuttle, uh, things like that. It was amazing, exciting. It was too expensive, way too expensive. Um, I remember putting out press releases uh, calling for NASA to scuttle the shuttle. It was the beginning of the new space age. One way to look at it is we had to clear the big tree out of the way so the little trees could grow. There are many other ways to look at it, but we had to get the government out of driving trucks. And that's what the shuttle was. It was an Uber, it was a truck, whatever you want to call it, but it, it was never going to enable the opening of the space. Governments cannot be allowed to do this. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So eventually we did succeed and, and new space is happening. Um, this this uh, this is funny. Uh, this article was in Space News, and you can see it's 2016, and they declared that we've won the revolution in 2016. We still haven't won the revolution, um, but the Space Frontier Foundation is uh, and other groups are out there fighting it. But now um, those gentlemen I showed at the beginning have arrived. I call them the billionaire cavalry. Um, they showed up starting around the year 2000, 20, uh, yeah, uh, 2000, and have been building and building. And you know, this day that we saw these reusable boosters, which by the way, is directly coming from the DCX I spoke about, uh, that was really a moment in history, but there are more to come. So what happens now? Well, look, I have these, uh, this idea, I call it the uh, three keys to the frontier. And these are the things you have to have if you're gonna open space. One, low cost transportation systems. Two, the use of local resources that are in space. And three, government support or at least they should stay out of the way. When it comes to government support, um, we've, like I said, we've spent a long time building a, and trying to change these policies. Uh, back in 2015, uh, when I started the Earthlight Foundation and New Worlds, uh, we held this meeting in Washington and brought in a bunch of lobbyists, uh, leaders. There are people in this picture that are from all the aerospace companies, Blue Origin, and Buzz Aldrin's in there, a whole bunch of folks. And we, we spent two days just getting them to use the S word, settlement. 
settlement. In other words, we were trying to get them to agree that the goal of the United States space, human space program in space was to enable, to enable human settlement. The first time that word now has formally shown up in uh, one of the US government documents, I think is this year. It's taken a while. Revolutions are slow. We have gotten several different policies in place and there are more policies coming. Um, you know, the Artemis Accords is the most recent one, but uh, part of the work I did in asteroid mining type activities, et cetera, was that we were able to, you know, both of our companies, Planetary Resources and Deep Space Industries, which was mine, um, we were too early. But what we were able to do was change that conversation about resources. And so now people are talking about them in a very real way, although mainly looking at the moon, I'm still an asteroid guy at heart. One of the things that happened during this period of time was when we realized that we weren't going to be able to defeat the station, we said, well, what can we do to use it? Now, I want to apologize to anybody who misunderstands my talk about frontiers, etc. The things that happened in um, the American West, um, and uh, you know the new world here, there are a lot of very unforgettable, uh, unforgivable, terrible things that happened regarding the indigenous people. So please understand that I accept that. I also say that when we're opening the new frontier, as we move beyond the earth, um, it's a different thing completely. But I wanted to use this analogy in the terms of that back in those days, the government would establish its own facility out on the frontier and by the way, Rome did the same thing and Greece did the same thing um, in that they would establish a fort. And what would happen would be that around that fort, a community would grow and start using the secure trade routes back and forth to quote unquote civilization, Rome or Athens or Sparta or um, you know, any of the major cities here in uh, North America um, on the East Coast. And what would happen is you go to a hundred years later and this is uh, Fort Toronto in the middle of a metropolis called Toronto. So it's kind of catalyzing. It's using the taxpayer dollars that are going into building that frontier outpost to ignite an economy. I mentioned flags and footprints. Well, look, I'm afraid that if we're not careful, we're gonna end up with that same thing again as we go back to the moon. And in, in, in my country, the US, a thing called Artemis is happening. I'm very disturbed. Um, I'm very excited and I'm disturbed. I'm excited that we're going back to the moon. I'm disturbed by the fact that we may not um, be putting in place those things which will enable us to grow beyond it. Uh, I was invited to a NASA meeting uh, last year. And if you look at this, this is the slides that the leaders of NASA were showing about Artemis and their human exploration program. Um, if you look at the second one there, it says annual lunar surface missions. And that by 2031, four, four government employees will stay on the moon for up to 30 days. I'm sorry, that is not exciting. That is not exciting at all. And I'm going to use that point to make it clear for anybody who looks at ESA, NASA, um, and the other government programs, uh, I'll come back to these guys, but ESA, NASA, or other government programs, their job right now, as defined by what they've been told by the parliaments and by Congress and others, is not to open space for you. Their job has been all along is to explore and do science and things like that. Those are all worthy. If you think that NASA is going to the moon to open it for you, that is your illusion. It is not happening. That is not what their job is. We can tell them that that's what their job needs to be. We can change that by lobbying our parliaments, our congresses, our um, you know whatever it is, and and in your in your in your nation. But that is not what they're going to do. These are government employees who are going, and they've been told to learn how to go to Mars. That's great, fine, fantastic. My point is that on your way to Mars, while you're learning, you need to be supporting those of us who are going to the moon or going into free space and going beyond. In other words, again, not a politically correct term, but if, if you're Columbus or if you're Magellan or um, 
you know, if you are Lewis and Clark here in North America and you're out exploring, that's great. Go do your thing. But in the meantime, we, the people need to go and we need to leverage off of that. Now, there is one government that is very clear on what it's doing and why it's going, and that's China. I almost think that they've been coming to our events for the last 30 years. I'm, I'm almost certain of it. Um, writing stuff down and going back and saying, well, heck, that's a good idea. Let's go because they are going. And I really hope we can all go together. I will say something here that may be a little bit startling, and it's something I've been working on actually the last few weeks. Um, I don't want to see the moon divided between Russia and China and India and the rest of us in terms of governments. You know what I'd like to see? I'd like to see China, India, Russia, and the United States all in the same moon village, all together. That makes it really hard to start dividing up the moon between people, right? Everybody in the same buildings, just like we did with the space station. However, different this time. That's where I want the government people to be. The companies, the free enterprise, the, the groups of people who are going out to build their own uh, villages and such, I want them to go all over the moon. Fine, great. Let's get those government people, lock them in a room together, because otherwise they're going to cause all kinds of trouble. The next one is the use of space resources. Now, in the Old West here in the U.S., we had these things called Conestoga wagons. What's really interesting about these is these are the rocket ships of their time. They're going out into the unknown, and they used very interesting engines. We call them horses. Those horses processed propellant. We call it grass. They got their propellant from where they were. They didn't carry a wagon full of propellant to go all the way across. No, they, they lived off the land. We have to do that in space. Use the resources where you are. One of the best resources we have in space is space itself. In fact, I want you to think about it this way. That iPhone that you've got out there, that one you're using is really, or whether it's an iPhone or an Android or whatever, um, that was created with a lot of government money and gives you access to the universe of human communications. And what the governments th did that were so great about that, and by extension, the internet, was they gave it to the people and the people went nuts with it and did all kinds of things. You know, and yeah, and now your, your, your grandmother can send you TikTok videos of cats doing weird stuff. But we are now connected to a global mind. We are able to ask any question of anything anywhere on the earth and have that answer because the people were invited to participate and create. The space station is our app development program for the rest of the universe. Still created by the government, um, tax dollars are put into it. But unfortunately, in this case, it is operated by the governments and we have not been allowed yet, yet. Now, it takes about 2.75 people just to keep that thing running. There's usually between three, six, seven people in there. That means that between one quarter of a person all the way up to maybe three and a quarter, four and a quarter people are all the brain power that is allowed to go into space and be there and imagine new things and come up with new ideas as we are all able to do on the internet and on our mobile phones. Think about that for a second. Imagine what happens when a million people are able to carry their imaginations into space. Imagine what happens when these folks get out there. So here's the thing, it's coming now. I was very, very lucky um, recently to go and see something in South Texas. And I don't know if this will work, but let's see if it happens. This is the first launch of Starship. It was amazing to watch. Yes, it blew up after a little bit. That's fine because this was an experiment. I wrote an article about this that's on space.com that failure is not just an option, it's a requirement. We keep doing it, we do it and doing it and doing it. And this is the transportation part, the ability to go to and from a place. That is one of the other keys of the frontier to be able to go to and from a place cheaply, regularly, reliably, and eventually safely. 
And that's what's happening now, right in front of us. So just to prove that it wasn't a, a failure, I was kind of in a fenced in area with some invited guests, but right behind me there, you'll see a group of people uh, out on the beach, young people, by the way, who are just having a great time. And They are not sad. In fact, that evening, I was lucky enough to be invited to a celebration, a party at Starbase. When I got over there, there were roughly, a, I think, seven or so of these things. Seven of them that haven't been launched yet that I've saw. I think there may be more. It's coming. It's coming now. It's coming in your lifetime. This is not an abstraction. This is not me in the 1980s going, hey, it's coming next week. No, it's coming now. And you know what? If, if Elon doesn't do it, Blue Origin's going to do it. Bezos is going to do it. He's been moving pretty slow, but there are a lot of changes going on in that company right now you're going to be hearing about over the next few months. And from what I understand, next year, they're going to start flying the new Glenn, which is also a reusable spaceship. Very important point there. Space ship. Rocket ship. Why do I use the word ship? Because you don't throw ships away. It's an important distinction. There's launchers. There's rockets, which use the rocket principle. And there's rocket ships. Language is important. One reason I'm excited about Blue Origin is that is a gigantic building they have there in Florida. From what I understand, there's a bunch of those new Glens in there being built right now. They're going to fly. And if those two guys don't pull it off, then there's folks like Peter Beck, our Kiwi friends, working on the Neutron. They're coming. It's all about to happen. And when we have these, we are truly going to be able to access the resources of space. We will be able to go out there. We will be able to build anything we want to build. The reusable rocket ship revolution is happening right now. We can see it happening. Now, there is this big orange thing. I'm not going to go way too far into this. I'll go through this pretty fast. This is a little American political uh, focused here, but um, it's called the SLS. Uh, I call it the Senate launch scam. Um, I've been fighting this for, goodness, the precursors, maybe up to 15 years. Um, and I, again, governments can't build rockets. This is the most expensive, largest, most polluting piece of garbage ever built. Why do I say piece of garbage? I'm not, I'm not like being uh, hyper, hyperbolic here. It's literally a piece of garbage because they throw it all away. It is garbage waiting to become garbage. It's pre- Garbage. We have to kill it. And you know what? Friends have told me, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And they, NASA in the background has been working to put a contract together so that it can keep going. And here's the interesting thing, the contrast. The SLS, $4 billion, a flight. Four billion dollars a flight. When Starship gets operating at full speed, ten million dollars a flight. Think about that for a moment. A massive, massive difference. Now, what's really interesting, those of you who follow space will know that uh, about two months ago, uh, I think it was the Congressional Budget Office here in the United States came out and said, and NASA actually admitted for the first time that the SLS is unsustainable. Private sector should be in charge of transportation to and from space. And why is that? Well, let's look at this. So there's the SLS built by NASA. 
their job is to make a lot of money, spend a lot of money, keep a lot of people employed in different political areas, things like that. This is the Starship. Now, basically, these two vehicles operate using the same principles. They use the rocket principles. You know, they burn stuff. It shoots out one end. The object goes the other way. It's pretty well basically the same thing. But look at the difference there. Between 2 billion and 4 billion per flight for the SLS, 2 million and 10 million per flight when the Starship gets operating. Different goal. You got to go somewhere. Want to go there fast. Want to get as many people out there as you can. Let me show this for a second. This is it. The opposite goal is between the aerospace industrial complex and new space. The complex, keep prices high, extend the project, maximum workforce. Those of you who are involved with ESA know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Spread those jobs all over Europe. You don't have a lot of market forces, they're political forces. Keep the government cash flowing to these projects once they start and don't, oh my goodness, do not rock the boat. New space, push prices down, fail fast, build better, minimize your overhead, compete in a market with other space systems, expand access to as many people and businesses and commercial operations as possibly, and fill those boats up with people if you're looking at opening the frontier. The old space myth was that only governments could play in space. The new space reality is that we all can go. We're democratizing space. We're bringing the price down so more people from more places can engage, can be a part of this. I gave a speech in Greece recently, and I had people telling me, well, we're Greece, you know, we're not really a space country. And I was like, and I showed them a bunch of slides about how far Greece was from space. And you know, it's a miracle. I mean, this is going to blow your mind. I mean, seriously, like Greece is about the same distance from space as America. Think about that for a second. Africa is about the same distance of space as Florida. We're all about the same distance from space. The difference in the distance is the distance in our imagination and our ability to dream and make things happen. So anybody can get involved. Everybody must get involved. Innovation is happening fast. We can bring costs down. This is an orbital tugboat, for example. And we can share the wealth. Free enterprise helps share the wealth. It helps spread things around. We want people to invest. We want people to be able to use the technologies. Enterprise works. Cooperation works. But we have to break out of the cage. Now, I'm looking at the time, and there's a lot more to this potential show that I can do right now. Um, and I was going to talk about the space declaration and some other things that are probably best for another time, uh, which I could roll into and we'd be here for another couple of hours. But uh, I think I want to leave some time so that we can uh, have some questions and, uh, and can go from there. But the one thing I do want to show you, and let me see if I can I'm gonna stop sharing for just a moment. And Thank you. There we go. Okay. Yeah, I um, I don't. Oops, sorry. We're still in. There we are. Okay, we're out of the show. That's great. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for this interesting uh, presentation and uh, very well uh, presented uh, presentation and. Um, you, um, the SRI has a lot uh, of what's common. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, uh oh, are you freezing up? We're losing your gods uh, or the presented gods. I'm freezing or I'm okay now? Yeah. Yes, you're good. Um, Yes. And um, yeah, uh, I think uh, we have a lot of things in, in common. Yeah. Many ideas in common and um, because of the internet is uh, our ideas and um, I would like to give you some questions from the chat 
Um, but really thank thank you for for being our mm -hmm. guest and for this nice presentation. Yes, um, yeah. Michael Mikhail uh, Baskov uh, is uh, asking uh, Baskov, uh, Baskov, sorry, um, the UDSSR uh, USA um, or USSR and uh, USA revived. Uh, played great role in boosting the space race uh, wine 1.0. Do you think that China prompting the space race uh, 2.0 uh, may actually benefit humankind? Yes. Um, and by the way, I was actually going to skip to a, skip through this thing and come back in, but we'll we'll do that another time. Uh, because what I did was I took you into all the gloom and doom of it. And normally I would go to the, the second part and I would show you the hopeful good stuff, the, the, the fun stuff, right? Um, and Adriano knows I, I talk about um, the principles of purpose that we have, but um, we'll skip that for now. I'll just go straight to these wonderful questions. Because um, I hate to I hate to end it like on that part. I had, you know, I, we blow the cage open later, but look, here's the thing. When it comes to um, a race, um, yes, that's good. Right. Let's get some competition going, that kind of thing. That is exciting. And and um, maybe the old model really required that the the original space race. Right. Um, that these global powers be racing out there. I don't know if we need it now. I don't know if we need to have that happen. Elon and those of us in the movement and Bezos and all these other people, Peter Beck, all these people are going, right? So nations require that, that competition really helps, things like that. That's, I get it. But so does the private sector in a peaceful way. Yes. So I don't know if we need, uh, you know, two imperialist nations fighting their way into space to get each other better and better and better. I think that's, maybe that's an older model. I don't know if we need it now. I think, look, Elon is going to Mars because he, it is in his soul that he believes humanity needs to expand out there. I'm funding, helping fund, my, my associates and I are helping fund small companies because it's in our soul. We believe it. Um, there are little companies I've heard of too springing up all over the place because they believe it. Now, if China's going to go, what'll be interesting will be, it won't be China competing against the, against the United States government. As opposed, you know, back in the old days, it was the USSR versus the US government. That's not the way it's going to be this time. It's going to be China competing against the US and global private sector. That's going to be very interesting to see. But I don't want to see is people getting up there and sort of staking claim to places in terms of, you know, this area belongs to China, this belongs to the United States. I want that to be. I want that to be over. I want it to be about people. Mm. Although I do believe people should be able to, to own the land on which they live. But I don't want to see these big corporate government, you know, kind of things happening. So I think um, it'll be a different kind of race. Yep, uh, you're right. But on the other hand, uh, all the private sector is doing it. Um because uh, they want to earn money uh, in some kind of way. And uh, Elon Musk uh, has his dream, but uh, he also wants to earn money. And um, uh, you have been at the Mars Society Convention and uh, you have seen that um, Robert Subrin has also, uh, has also mentioned um, that we have to produce pro uh, propellant in space or uh, on Mars and uh, all this. And they are doing a lot of research. And um, yeah, but I think um, if um, the private sector, also it has to be ruled in a certain kind of way. We had some speakers here, uh, Michelle Hanlon and other speakers, uh, because um, we have to avoid uh, the wild west uh, in in space. Uh, you know what I yeah. mean? Uh, that uh, yeah, yeah, I do. I, I do know what you mean. But let's let's be clear about this. The west wasn't that wild. Let's be really, really clear. There would be no United States if the west was what it looks like in the movies, with everybody shooting each other all the time, right? It wasn't like that, right? I mean. 
that's great for movies. That's, you know, that's like when you watch the news, I was saying earlier, it's the bad stuff that makes the news. It's the bad stuff that makes good movies and things like that. The West, really, there were a lot of laws. There were rules, right? You, you couldn't roll in and, and, and you know, and, and, and steal from people. And, and again, the indigenous issue, totally understood. But as we go out this time, and I can tell you, I'm firsthand, I'm not sitting here in a chair in a university saying, well, this is how it should be. I actually have founded companies. I actually fund companies. I am literally on the front line of this. We want rules. We need rules. Nobody's going to invest a dime in a space company if somebody can come along and just take it over. You know, yeah. when we were doing the asteroid mining company, I had people come to me and said, you know, I believe you guys have the technology. I believe you know what you're doing. I believe all of these things. I just need to know that if you mine that asteroid, you're allowed to keep it and sell it, what you get out of it. That's government. So we need that to a certain extent. We absolutely need it. Michelle is very correct on that one. The question is, and this, this goes beyond, and I, I like to kind of shoot beyond things where they are now. As we get out there, I'm just going to give you a thought experiment. At some point in the next 100 years, human beings are going to have the tools. They'll have space solar power. They'll be able to harvest resources in space. They'll be able to manufacture. They'll be able to use DNA. They'll be able to do all of these different things and make anything they need out there, right? And you actually set me up accidentally to, to talk about what I was going to talk about anyway. So <laughs> they, those people who are out there will not be able to be coerced by people on the earth. Mm. See, the reason Elon has to follow the rules of the earth is that Elon's personal house is on the earth. And if he pisses off somebody or upsets a government, they've got him. He's down here. He's under their control. His corporations trade on the earth. There are going to be groups of people going out into the solar system who don't need the earth at all. Now, how do you control them? How do you have them follow rules, right? You can't. What we have to have is a new morality. What we have to have is a new set of core moral guidelines. And this is the biggest thing that I'm doing. Um, and forgive me, I'm going to roll on this for just a second. But this is what Earthlight's about. Setting up core principles. Right? And the, the Earthlight Foundation has three principles. And I'm, I'm urging, I went to the Mars Society to urge them to adopt the Space Declaration and the principles of Earthlight, because Earthlight is not an organization as much as it is a disseminator of these core ideas. And that is, A, that we are here for a purpose, and that purpose is to protect and expand the domain of life. Number two, to honor and evolve human civilization. And number three, explore and experience the universe. Honor means I honor you, no matter where you come from, who you are, what your beliefs are. But we're going to go out there and get better at being humans. Because we're not really good at it right now. We're a bunch of apes with rockets. We need to get a lot better as we, and we can, to protect the mother world. Earth is precious. We, it may be the only planet in the universe. Maybe. I don't want it to be. But I can only bet on the cards I can see, and this is the one I can see. It's precious. So we have to take care of her. And I, to expand life, and this is my mission in, in, in the universe, is to take life where there is no life. Butterflies on Mars, trees on the moon, children being born throughout the solar system as we go out and out and out. Now, within that, we are going to have to have cultural mores, cultural rules, cultural morality. It's interesting. This will be the first time since humanity was hunter-gatherers, when we were hunter-gatherers, before we even really settled down for agriculture, we lived 100% off the land. And they had to have rules between tribes and rules between wandering groups for how you would interact with each other and things like that. 
we're going full circle. We're going to be living off the land in the universe, going all the way back. I'm about the power of the individual, not the power of governments, not the power of corporations, but the individuals and families and groups of people. Um, Sorry, I, I, I completely agree with you, but um, uh, I remember um, yeah. Che Guevara uh, because he went to Bolivia uh, to bring um, the revolution there and uh, he wrote about the new uh, human, the neue Mensch, uh, and he had these ideas too, but the human is like he is. And I think you cannot change it and um and um yeah and um i have yeah to admit that i i think you cannot change human uh they will be jealous they will be uh thinking of uh having more have more property than the other ones and uh, to feel better than the other ones and um yeah mm -hmm. and they, they can show a nice character when they go into space but uh if they are out of rules uh maybe they show their the real character and uh you know what i mean so um mm -hmm. no i understand what you're saying and uh adriana was going to say something go yeah, ahead no. yes i I took several notes during your speech because it was really very rich and crowded of uh, important concepts and uh, and uh, let me say roots because you mentioned uh, several common roots that are at the basis of the uh, space philosophy, let me say, of the new space philosophy and the space renaissance philosophy. And uh, uh, yeah, I think that for sure we have a common father, as Jerry O'Neill, mm -hmm. because uh, he was uh, really maybe the first one to think about uh, bringing civilians into space. Mm -hmm. Because he said about, uh, he, he thought about regular people. You say the families, no, regular people in, in space. Correct. And the proof of that is that he designed a rotating infrastructures. To, to make uh, uh, to simulate uh, gravity mm -hmm. it's very important for for uh, uh, preserving human health and uh, and our shape you know, and our body our physiology you no know? uh, so I I think that uh, yeah one is is Gerard O'Neill and the other one is Kraft Erike also it, it was Erike, yeah. a member of the Werner Braun uh, team. And uh, uh, yeah, I think another important thing uh, that we have to understand uh, the milestones, the key milestones mm -hmm. of the space. I be I believe in in my what what I'm trying sometimes to reconstruct the the history. You no, know? mm -hmm. the the first uh, milestone was the X Prize. Uh, the 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 winning of the X Prize in, in 2004 by Scale Composite because it was the first time that uh, cheap access to space was demonstrated because they, they made Spaceship One with $30 million given by Paul Allen, the, the mm -hmm. partner of Bill Gates. And that was a definitely a very disruptive thing if you think that uh, uh, NASA uh, spend those money every morning uh, uh, while drinking their coffee, no? And uh, and uh, the, uh, each flight of the space shuttle was uh, uh, five hundred million. And, yeah, yeah. yeah, and uh, so it it was. Uh, uh, let me say the the beginning of another view of space. Uh, cheap, uh, the cheap access to space, low cost access to space. And this was, the, I, I think, the first key milestone in this process. And the second one is 2015, when mm -hmm. the first Falcon 9 landed. So it was demonstrated that it was possible to reuse rockets, something that up to that time was uh, just a dream, science fiction. 
and, and, and nobody, uh, nobody even thought about saving, uh, reusing the first stage of the rockets. So really Elon Musk made something similar to the egg of Columbus, you know, uh, the famous egg of Columbus when, Col when Columbus uh, uh, broke an egg on the table and said, okay, I can, I can make a, uh, one egg to stand, Bra uh, break, break, breaking it. And okay. so uh, Musk said, we are not able to make a single stage to orbit reusable. Okay, let's reuse the first stage. Mm -hmm. That was simple. Why nobody thought about that before? Well, see, again, I, I want to be really clear. I, I, I was trying to make this point early on in the talk. Those are both important. But 20 years before, or 15 years before, the DCX, in fact, there's a reason SpaceX is, has an X in the name and the X Prize has an X in the name, yes. because they were young people when the DCX flew, right? And the DCX, demonstrated working on single stage and reusability. In fact, Elon called into the reunion, uh, the last reunion and, and thanked, uh, thanked them. And Jim French, who designed the engines for I think Blue Origin was there at the reunion uh, two weeks ago. That's number one number. And then the Conestoga that I talked about that flew, um, that was in the nineties, well before the X Prize occurred, right? Um, and so these things, they're all good. They're all important milestones. Yeah, they're certainly all important milestones. But I think that there's it's important to understand that there is a group of people who are all pushing this on, on different fronts. They do all come from Jerry. That's the number one thing. Dr. O'Neill is the godfather for all of this. Um, but we are moving that way. It is going to break loose. It is going to happen. And I, um, Sabine, am a believer in humans. Me too. You know, this afternoon, I guarantee you one thing I will not be doing this afternoon is going to the Coliseum to watch gladiators chop each other up. So I do believe human beings get better. Right now, we may have the ability to kill more people with the push of one button, but the basic savagery of human beings, we're getting better and better at it. We're getting better and better. And I believe I'm positive. I'm a positive person regarding human beings. It is to me, largely governments that start wars, not people. It is governments that start wars. It is media that amplifies hate. It is politicians that push people to the extremes mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. causes them to fight each other. I don't mm -hmm. believe that is necessarily, you know, look, all, all you have to do is get on an airline on an international flight and watch how kind people are to each other, you know, except for that one crazy person who probably drank too much in the lounge. But other than that, you know, everybody, it, it, people work together. People care about each other. And look, the whole point of frontiers, the whole point of being able to go into a new place and do new things is to try and evolve who we are, to become new, to become better. To, to find our higher purpose. Otherwise, yeah, what's the point? We may as well just shoot ourselves in the head right now. I mean, the idea here is that we have the chance to begin re redefining humanity in new ways. Elon isn't going to space to make money. He made his money to go to space. Mm -hmm. Jeff was 16 or 17 when he first got his hands on the high frontier by Jerry O'Neill. And he said in school, I want to make money, basically, roughly, not quoting him or anything, but I'm going to make money and then I'm going to open space to humanity. Yes, they're going to make money. Great. They have to pay these things. They have to make these things pay. One of the, one of the big challenges we have in terms of uh, people buying tickets to space is that it's getting characterized as, oh my God, the rich people are all gonna go, they're gonna leave the earth behind and they're gonna migrate. I hate the word migrate. Um, they're gonna go into space. They're gonna expand humanity into space. But I wrote an article on that. It's also on space.com about four years ago. I called it the Elysium effect. The Elysium effect was a rather mediocre I want to movie. mention this movie, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
the me the Elysium effect kind of mediocre movie where the rich people basically all go to what I call the ultimate gated community okay. and if, the poor people have to stay on the earth if I can briefly interrupt you I yes, think sir. Elysium is a beautiful movie but the vision of that of that uh, uh, director is old is classist is a classist vision well that's my whole point that's my whole point that's why I called yeah. That's, if, you, if you read the article, are, what, we say, what we ahead. say, what we say, especially in essence, and we we de developed that in the, our last Congress in 2021, is that achieving a bigger platform of resources, achieving abundance of resources, a lot of good people will be allowed to be good. Absolutely. Because Absolutely. they are, people are good. If you, I think if you put people, I'm humanist too. If if you put people in a situation where they can live and work and have fun, they are very much happier than to fight each other. Exactly, and I just want to be really clear, Adriano. They only fight. They only fight each other when they are constrained to do that, and when they, mm. when uh, crazy politicians, we are seeing these days right. in Israel. Yes. I wanted yeah. to mention, and we, and we let we yeah. let too many we let too many men be in charge um, to, to put fuel in the fire, you know, and uh, right. ex exacerbate uh, religious differences and all these mm -hmm. kind of things. Uh, that I have, have you know, questions from the chat, Adriano. Yeah, yeah. real quick, real quick, uh, Adriano. I just want to be really clear. I don't want to go in that discussion because it's too big and too heavy. Yes, yes. Yeah, I just want to very quickly, Adriano. I just need to clarify that. I was using the Elysium effect in the opposite way. So you and I are on the same side. I was saying in the article, when you read the article, that when peop some people see rich people in space, they're going to see that movie in their head and they're going to come after the people that are going. I was using it in the reverse way. I was, it's a word game I was using. It was backwards. So you and I are on the same page, 100%. Right there with you. I'm 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 with you too, but I wanted to to point it out. I have more questions uh, from the chat here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because there are many questions. Um, how much time do you have left? <laughs> I, I can say a little bit more. I, I do have to. Okay, run okay. Uh, Denise uh, Afonso Rivero uh, uh, is asking asking what can be done in terms of new space projects under the scope of the Artemis Accords. And I would like to add another question from Mikhail Basco. Uh, do you think a scenario described in Artemis by any wire may work? Um, a, country, a, country, a country, Kenya in this case, uh, creates incentives uh, to companies to invest in space. Yes, I mean, should countries create incentives for companies to invest in space? A country create creates uh, incentives to companies to invest in space. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. That's the best way to go. And if the country is going to spend money, this is my challenge, my issue with Artemis. We come from our space program comes from what I call a use it and throw it away psychology. Mm. That's what the SLS is. It's a great big advertisement for the old way of doing things. In uh, Earthlight, we talk about the four R's, reuse, repurpose, recycle, resources. If NASA is going to spend my taxpayer money going back to the moon, I want them to do it in such a way that those dollars are helping grow the moon villages. In other words, I don't want them to go there, trash the place, run out of money, which is what happened with Apollo, and then be done. And nobody can follow them because it's too expensive. And if they're going to develop, for example, I'll put it this way. Here's one I've, I've been running into a lot lately. Um, some friends are talking about, you're seeing all these new space stations, and some of them rotate to provide gravity. Well, what people don't realize is the original space station, the International Space Station, had plans to have a centrifuge on it so that we could learn about different kinds of gravity and space. It got thrown away. Why is that? Because government explorers are not going to live in space, so they don't care 
about adapting to gravity or what it does to you in multiple generations. In other words, NASA astronauts never planned to go in space and live there. So why would they spend money learning how to stay there? It's not in their, it's, it's not in the funding. It's not their mandate. So that's what I was pointing out. They're going to go to the moon and stay for 30 days at a time. They don't need to learn what happens when a baby is born on the moon or born in space or born on Mars. Mm -hmm. It's not part. Of, so we have to change what they're studying. It's, it's not, they're doing exactly what they've been told to do. Go visit, go camp out. I don't want to go camp out. I'm going to go mm. out there and start new generations. Mm. So let's invest the money. And yes, Kenya, anybody. The other point uh, real quick on that is a lot of countries seem to have it in their head and it's reinforced by the space countries that, oh yeah, you can do some satellites and study your crops and, you know, I call that the ghetto, the space ghetto, you know, you can do some little stuff and whatever. Don't play with the big kids, you know, only the big kids can send humans out there. No, that's not true. Especially when we get SpaceX rolling or look at what Axiom's doing, flying people from different countries. You know, it, it's, it's going to open up as it gets more, less expensive. And then we'll start moving towards people that can actually live out there. And what can be done in terms of new space projects under the scope of the Artemis Accords? Um, well, I think the Artemis Accord starts setting some basic frameworks. That's good. Um, but I think that we need to be able to go out there and work on all kinds of new, I want to see um, harvesting of resources and things like that. What I don't want to see, this gets into a matter of taste. And, and uh, like, for example, personally, this is just me personally, and there's no great, huge reason for this other than I think it would suck. I don't want to see anything done on this side of the moon. You know, I, 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 there are people that say that as a sacred thing. That's fine. If that's one of, you want to do that, your argument, I just don't want to have to look at it every night. I don't want to go out and see strip mines on this side of the moon. I don't care what you do on the other side. There was no spiritual attachment or, uh, you know, 100,000 year old attachment to the far side of the moon and the, the, the God creatures we might see, you know, in the, in the images of the moon. Go, you want to go mine? Go mine on the other side. Fine. I don't care. Go. I would rather you mine the moon. I would rather you mine asteroids than the bottom of the oceans or rip the heart out of a living ecosystem on a mountain. You know, th these things, I want to see it happen off planet. I think asteroids are going to be better in the long run. Yes. I, I, uh, I, I let think me take the questions from the chat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just a small thing. I think the next uh, key milestones will be to have a fully reusable launch vehicle, the Starship, finally working. Mm -hmm. And the other one is starting producing fuel in space because you're right about the horses, no? The right. <laughs> fuel in situ. Okay, so Those three keys, the three keys. So I plowed to any initiative that uh, works in this direction, to these two milestones. So good if they throw away SLS and use Starship, because it will improve, uh, go, go uh, make faster improvement of, of the Starship it, itself. Totally and agree. good if they make uh, in the Artemis Accord, in the in the settlements on the moon, etc. Start mining and start working, experimenting how to process the regulate uh, regulate and and and, and uh, make uh, fuel from that, and uh, uh, mining some asteroids, some near Earth asteroid. I saw. A very interesting uh, presentation in Baku at the IAC 74 about uh, uh, te technologies and methodologies to catch near Earth asteroids, bring them in Earth uh, uh, or cislunar um, orbits, and start mining and, and start uh, refining and, and C2. Uh, so these are the fundamental things to be done. And of course, uh, rotating uh, because it's never too late. Uh, and never too early to start experimenting simulated gravity because I think this is the biggest delay that we have in the in 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 in, in all the problems because uh, we we experimented for 
30 years, no, more than 30 years, because there was a mirror before, and uh, the, 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 so, uh, zero. I want to cut, I cut you. <laughs> we keep on experimenting zero gravity, but what do we want to experiment more about zero gravity? We right. just want to make, to make these poor astronauts to have problems when they come back right. <laughs> to learn. Mm. Yeah, circulate, uh, cir uh, blood circulation, and a lot of very bad things. So we learn a lot. Yeah, Sabine, what do you got? Yeah. So, here's yeah, another ahead. question. Hmm? Pardon? No, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, from uh, Iglobos, uh, close pastors make work from home from ELEO uh, settlement, as so E L E O settlement. What do you think? Uh, ELEO requires a little or more radiation protection for, uh, for settlement? Okay, what was the first part? I didn't quite understand. Uh, close passes makes work, work from home from ELEO settlement, as so E L E O settlement. Um, yeah, so. No, I mean, look, the challenges of, of, of radiation, um, you know, my radiation, microgravity, uh, and vacuum are, are major challenges. Um, yeah, I course. think they're all, I think we can deal with all of them, right? I think that rotating our habitats helps us with the, the gravity issue. And we have, I think, two of the new stations. My friend, uh, Grant Bonin, here's an interesting point. Um, the, the people that were part of Deep Space Industries, um, you know, we were going to go mine asteroids. Um, one of them is a guy named Grant Bonin. He has a company called Gravity Labs. And it's about using uh, uh, small rotating laboratories to, to do gravity related activities in space. The other one was a guy named Daniel Faber. And he has a company called Orbital Fab, Orbit Fab, which is propellant in space. And then the third one, uh, one of the, the other leader of the company is a guy named Sagi Kafir, who was former counsel, uh, well, he was our counsel with Deep Space Industries, and he helped write some of the laws for space resources. So we're kind of, the company broke up, but we're all out here causing trouble. Um, and the thing is that um, we have to take care of, I believe that as we go out, there's going to be two things. We're going to learn how to deal with radio radiation mechanically, whether that's new materials. One of the companies we're investing in has uh, some materials that help reduce the amount of radiation that goes through through those materials. In fact, they're going to be selling vests to people that work in x-ray labs and hospitals, things like that. Um, but we'll also be dealing with them biologically. There are bacteria that live in nuclear facilities that are able to produce and re uh, repair the damage to their genes caused by radiation. So we're going to have variations on humanity that I call them homo marzialis, homo lunaris, and homo spatialis. And these are going to be different variations on human beings that are a little more designed for where it is they're going to be living as they move out. Um, yeah, I think we can deal with all of that. The, the big one is our psychology. Go ahead. Uh, Cheryl Gallica sends you greetings and a nice, pre a great presentation as usual, Rick. <laughs> and uh, thanks. Uh, nice to see you. And Werner Grandel is asking, yeah, I wanted to send you the screen. Uh, what kind of society will exist on space habitats? Will it be a democratic one or an oligarchy with Elon or Jeff on top? Any idea? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the thing is to save time, I stopped right before I was going to talk about the space declaration, which is this combination of you should be able to go out there and do anything you want, anywhere you want, use the resources any way you want, as long as you respect the Declaration of Human Rights and um, th there's several other clauses to it. And it basically the idea is, look, go do what you're going to do. Go try everything. Go experiment, do whatever it is you want to do. As long as you are kind to each other, you respect each other, you respect the mother world, you don't damage the earth, and you respect any life that you run into when you're out there. So we'll have different kinds of entities. Yeah, Elon's going to do his thing. And you know what happens, by the way? 
no matter in, in human history, this is guaranteed to be true. Whenever people on the country that's sending out the people goes out there and says, okay, you're going to be doing this thing and you're going to be like paying us taxes or you're going to have the government like ours, et cetera. Like two generations in, the people that get out there say, screw you, we're doing our own thing. So whether it's China sending out people that have to be loyal to the CC, you know, the, the, the Chinese Communist Party or our people or Elon sends a bunch of people and they have to like take an oath to SpaceX, which I, they probably won't do that. But let's say they go do that. About two generations in, they're going to say, you know what? That was a great idea at the beginning, but we're going to make up our own rules because you don't understand what it's like to live here. Guaranteed that's what's going to happen. You know, um, and it was funny. I, uh, I talk about the declaration about three years ago, and you can see this online. Um, there was a paper, uh, a company called the, the Guardian newspaper wrote an article because Elon had buried in some of the contracts that you sign for um, his different activities and way in the small print, it said, uh, you know, we follow the rules of earth until we get to Mars and then we're gonna follow the rules of Mars. And, and uh, you know, and people who buy like Starlink are signing this. And if you look way down in there, that's what it says. And they went crazy about it. There's an article in the Guardian, they interviewed somebody and they said, well, we're gonna follow this crazy Earthlight Foundation's declaration, space declaration. And it blew my mind. I said, what? I hadn't even published it. But they read it and apparently thought, you know what, this will work because it's very minimal. It's only three paragraphs. And that's all we need. We don't need to over constrain people. If they have a shared morality of caring for each other, caring for the environment and caring for where it is we're going, then you don't need a lot of rules. You can go out there and just do things. I, you know? you. I completely agree with you. I have two more questions. Um, one from Dennis. Um, he totally agrees uh, with the mining aster uh, that mining asteroid is a lot more doable. Doable, and uh, he's asking, "What is your op opinion about uh, the orbiting lunar gate gateway? <laughs> the gateway." Uh, the gateway is a political creature. Lunar Great Gateway was created essentially by a group of people. There's a guy named Bill Gerstenmeyer, associate administrator of NASA. And in a way, what he was doing there was cover, excuse my language, he, he was covering their posterior at NASA, depending on which way we were going to go. Because they didn't know at the time, you know, are we going to go to the moon? Because at the point, at that point, NASA, some NASA supporters were afraid, oh, we're going to get stuck on the moon and we'll never go to Mars. It was a big political consideration. Uh, and there are all these other things. Um, they also knew how to do space stations because they had one. So we just go do another one and we can translate our skills out there. But you don't need a gateway. But I get it. I understand it. It could be useful. But you don't need it for a starship, for example. You need, as Adriano was saying, you need to be able to refuel. And hopefully you could refuel on the moon, you could refuel between here and the moon, things like that. You don't need a gateway, but fine. It's not my, I don't care. I'm not going to stop there. I'm going straight out. So, <laughs> okay. you know, but if they want to build one to keep Boeing happy and keep the international partners happy and la, 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 la. See, we're, we're actually, Sabine and, and Adrian, and what we're hitting right now is this point where the private sector, citizen companies are starting to split now. Until now, they've been either under the government or sort of, you know, I showed that picture with the horses and the wagon, right? So the wagon is Artemis, right? And the horses, are like SLS and Blue Origin and Starship. And they've all got lots of contracts with the wagon, which is NASA and ESA and Artemis. And right now they've got them all tied up. So they all kind of have to move together. You can't go faster than the wagon because all their money is coming from NASA and ESA and, and the government agencies. Eventually those horses are going to come unhitched and go in their own way and at their own speed 
going to take a couple more years, but it's going to happen. Some other grass in the middle, right. like orbital debris. There is, oh, yeah, there is a, yeah. a lot of aluminum in, in uh, big wreckages of aluminum, made of aluminum. Mm -hmm. And from aluminum, we can get fuel. Right. That's another way to get fuel from orbital debris reprocessing. Yes. It is the, the orbital debris problem makes my point about the old way of doing things. Yeah. All right. We're doing it here on the planet. We trash the planet. Now we're trashing orbit. I'm trying to stop us from yeah. trashing the solar system and the universe. That's that's what ignorant apes do. They like eh. they just throw stuff around. They don't care. And I, I apologize to apes. But I mean, it is really we have to have this new morality that says reuse, recycle, repurpose resources. Right. And by the way, when you're in space, yeah. you know, I, one, of, one of the things I like to say, there's no bigger environmentalist than a person floating in space, looking out the window at the earth, rebreathing her own air, redrinking her own urine, recycled as fresh water. That person understands that the earth itself is a spaceship and we have to treasure it. Environmentalism and, and family values, new kind of family values, not the old ones, but all of that comes from realizing you're stuck in this little place and your life depends on not wasting things, on trusting each other, on loving each other, on taking care of each other, and taking care of this place you're in. So as we go out there, we actually get to model all of the behaviors that we're getting so bad at down here. Yes. Right? So anyway. But you I, get, I get going. The, I get excited. You, so. you, you mentioned uh, the, the, the horses and the wagon, and uh, this generation was very uh, and, um, good to the environment because uh, they reused things, uh, they repaired things, and uh, they had not so much money and resources, so they had to take care of this. And um, yeah, maybe we will have it. So the last question I will give you from Ina Lassen, why is the development of an ideology that goes in the direction of a monetary free system not even mentioned here? Okay. Shall I repeat it? And this is an inter interesting question because I think we will not have money in space. Okay, oh, a monetary do they exist mass coins, but um, yeah. A so money-free system in space. Hmm? That's But great. You remember Robert Einlein, no? in, in The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, when he wrote to Tan Staffel, there, is, ain't, there, there aren't such thing as a free lunch. Uh, and yet, and yet here's, the funny, <laughs> here's, the, here's the funny thing. I, um, a friend of mine who's much younger than I am, and he comes from sort of the crypto generation, I gave him a copy of The High Frontier. And he read it and he gets, I forgot, it was like chapter three or whatever. It comes back to me. He said, Rick, Dr. O'Neill predicted a DAO. Okay, a distributed autonomous organization. And if you look at the high frontier, there's a part in there with the gent the father, you know, there's this little girl writing back about how she lives on this thing. Her dad works on, I think, building both solar power satellites using asteroid materials and all of that. And his work and labor goes into this index that they have, or it doesn't use the word index, but it goes into a place. And then his ability to participate in the government or his and his, uh, he and his wife's ability to participate in the government, and everything is based on how much work they do, what kind of work they do and things like that. So our friends over at the Moon Dow are working on that kind of an activity uh, as the, your questioner asked about, look, that's, Bottom line, every time we move into a new frontier, every time we cross out of what we're comfortable with and we go into a new place, we reinvent ourselves or we have the opportunity to do so. And we can operate, we can, yeah, we can take the, uh, the Wall Street, eh, you know, whatever, I'm going to take it all kind of thing, you know, um, and go do that. Or we can look at it and say, you know what, there's a new opportunity to try something different. That's what it's all about. The one thing I am sure of is that unless we open ourselves up, unless 
we create new places to go that inspire us and bring us together and, 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 and create some hope for humanity, we are doomed. So let's get out there. And if somebody wants to go have a cashless society and a crypto-based blockchain society, that's wonderful. Go do it. What we have to do is get that first 100 miles, as Heinlein said, Adriano, 100 miles up and you're halfway to anywhere. Let's get 100 miles up and be halfway to a new civilization. That's our job right now. Yep. Thank you so much. Adriano, do you have another question? No, I think we can we can stop here now, but okay. please, we are not stopping because there is a lot more to discuss. And to yes, uh, I would suggest, uh, Rick, we would like to invite you again to our webinar series if you have time, because yeah, was... one of these days I'll come in and we'll just do the declaration and the philosophy part, which is. And, and also, also, I think yes. uh, you and me and others, we have to talk uh, the next days about the continuation of the 18 SDG campaign. Yes, yes, and I congratulate you on that. I still support it. I'm kind of up to my uh, whatever in uh, whatever working on my my event and uh, all of that, but certainly, absolutely, and anybody who's listening should reach out um, to Space Renaissance and find out how to support what it is you're working on, because I think you're working on great Thank stuff. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay, so I will write to you maybe tomorrow or mm -hmm. in the next days about uh, how we can continue and try to... Right. And go listen to the Space Revolution. Maybe, Adriano, I get you on there as a guest at some point. We will talk. Uh, and uh, like I said, Peter Beck is going to be on there probably in the next couple of weeks. It's called the Space Revolution on IROC Space Radio. Fantastic. Oh. Okay, and that's why I bought the sexy microphone because it yes. <laughs> Rick, we, we thank you so much. <laughs> exactly. I, I have my ear. I, I thank you so we thank you so much for being with us uh, for this really wonderful presentation. And um I thank to our audience for staying so long with us and um I think they found it very interesting. And uh, if I see the questions, I would like to mention our next webinar. It's uh, on next uh, Monday, on Monday 16th of October. Jerry Stone and Werner, Werner Grandel will talk about Space Habitats uh, Committee, um, uh, Space Habitats. And um, yeah, you are invited to join yeah, us. <laughs> and uh, in the work of the, of the Space Science Academy Committee. On space. Genau. Hmm? Genau. Also, this is a, yeah. Or as they say, uh, live long and uh, perspire, uh, prosper. Yeah. Not prosper. Yeah, yeah, genau. All right. Thank you so much. I'm going away. Goodbye. Thank yeah. You. Goodbye. Thank you. Ciao. Ad Astra. <laughs>